we're gonna go bye bye for like a minute or so, and then we'll be back with BTB TV episode ten. Music we're getting. You're gonna need me to load any web pages or anything, it's not gonna happen. For some reason Chrome's just going crazy on me and not letting me load anything.
Alright, what's up guys? Welcome to BTV TV episode 10. That song you just heard was linked in the chat. It's Demons by Fennec Solar. So today for you, we've got some more updates coming in from the, uh, I guess, Spring Challenge world. I don't know what we're going to call it anymore. It's been updated to a different style of tournament. But, my mic, yeah, my mic's unmuted. Um, so for today... The first thing we want to start off with is we were looking for a graphic designer and we've been looking and looking and looking and uh, if anyone knows of the Halo Diehards website, there, I believe she's the owner, uh, Addicted to Chaos applied and her work is actually really nice. If you guys haven't seen any of it, head over to halodiehards.net, I believe, and check out her work there. Most of the graphics there are done by her, so she'll also be doing the graphics from here on out for BTBnet as well. Um, so many people have been asking over and over, uh, when's the spring challenge happening? When's the spring challenge happening? Uh, we don't have an official date for that yet, but spring, yeah, sometime in the spring, it's, it's April, we're getting close. Um, uh, we have until June 20th to get it started sometime around there. Whenever the, what is it? It's winter, not summer solstice, summer solstice, <laughs> unless yeah. you're in Australia, then it, then, then it's. Well, spring is like six months away, so... Hey, we can just pretend we're Australian. It's Hashtag late. spring is coming. Alright, so um, one thing that we have done is Matt Clan. I believe you announced it last week, maybe the week before, uh, maps have been finalized. If you guys haven't gotten a chance to play those, they're on the tag official space BTB net. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do some fly-throughs here for you. We've got them all capped and everything, and then we're just going to let you guys watch those. Matt Clan is going to talk about some of the big updates for the game, or for the maps, because um, a lot of the maps have actually gotten some pretty decent makeovers. And then, um, yeah, so Matt Clan, take it away. We're starting with Vortex. Okay, the biggest change we made with Vortex is that we shifted it from being a capture the flag map um, playing base to base to being an extraction map with dynamic spawns, players being able to spawn all around the map. And so of course we also adjusted the uh, weapon and power up layout as you'll see throughout this video. Um, so both teams can have a fairly equal chance at contesting everything off the start, but after that the spawns will become variable based on positioning and deaths and objective, like current objective positions. Uh, so we have, and that actually plays quite well. It's uh, fairly fluid, and teams have to set up in advance. They have to know where each extraction site is going to move to. And so one thing that I've noticed is early on in the video, the snipers seem to have switched sides. Uh, what was the reasoning behind that change? I moved them specifically so that they're in more sheltered locations now, so that due to the dynamic spawns that if you spawn near them or even away from them, you have a chance to pick it up and not get killed straight away. You don't have to worry about somebody spawning right on you when you get over there because it's a fairly sheltered location with a few spawn points of its own. And so now, uh, for the stream viewers, we're flying by where the Wraith used to be and it's not there anymore. Um, did you add any more vehicles to the map? I think we saw a Mantis get flown by earlier. Is that it? I actually, uh, we actually, I actually turned the vehicles back. Um, I did extra Warthogs on the side near the High Cave what was a, a cave in Dominion. Um, so there's one Warthog near each exit of that now, and just the Mantis underneath uh, what would have been C base for Dominion. So the overall like vehicle density's increased, but there are less heavy vehicles now, so it's more focused on infantry light vehicle combat, which I think suits extraction a lot better. Makes sense. And there's also still a laser on this map, so anyone who's worried about the Mantis getting a little too overpowered, there's still that laser there to help you out with that. There are also four plasma pistols, which are very, very effective against the Mantis. Use the plasma pistol. Yeah, you can find one in each base and one in the rocks in front of each base as well. And so, oddly, uh, you've done a lot of work actually with the spawn system throughout Halo 4. I know you're working with Ghost Ami on a lot of the uh, throwdown settings, the V1, V2, V3, etc. Um, for extraction, especially with dynamic spawns, what's something you want to prevent doing with any spawn points? Um, or really I, I guess I guess, I guess a, I guess a better question is, uh, in order to control maps with dynamic spawns, 
Is there something you want to do in extraction, especially since we have three plot extraction? Is there a more efficient way to control spawns, or is it something that you're just gonna have to adapt? Well, to what's in, extra going on? in extraction, the extraction points themselves are negative weighting on the spawn, so generally you'll see people spawning away from where the extraction point is. So just wherever the extraction points are live. That's controlling the spawns for you, and you have to keep that in mind when you're setting up spawns on a map. Alright, so John, you have anything last to add from Vortex? No, other than that, the most, the most heavily weighted spawns um, are going to be in the corners, and like in the sniper corners and the warthog corners. With uh, Then there are some slightly less weighted spawns towards the middle and inside each of the bases. So our next map that we're going to fly around is Wreckage. This was a new map added in the Mythic map pack, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this is a map Majestic. that... Uh, Majestic? Oh, Mythic, Majestic. They both start with Wait, wait. No, uh, Crimson was the first DLC. That's the one with Harvest and uh, oh, Wreckage. Crimson. Right. Shows how much I followed the maps. But What's a map pack? <laughs> says Oddly, the man who bought the season pass and didn't even know. Um, but so, Wreckage, one of the new maps that we're seeing, um, there's only been, I believe, the DLC playlist for it. Uh, I think it's been integrated into Extraction now. As it yeah, it's probably an Extraction. And so... And even Team Objective. Um, it's something new that we've experienced. It hasn't been an Infinity, uh, BTB or anything. You've kind of just taken it from the ground up and tried to make it into something competitive. So, what have you done with it? Uh, first I said, well, pretty much left the teams to spawn on the sides as they were, because if you divide, you can sort of divide it into a roughly symmetrical area if you cut it down the middle with going with the upper platform that both mine cannons lead to and taking it straight out to the sea from there. So cutting it through the middle uh, room and out across a little block on the beach. And so spawn the teams near each man cannon so they can lift up to the top easily. And we've got an extraction site up there, that's Alpha, as well as the rocket launcher. Um, the room in the middle is Bravo side. We've got a regeneration field spawning in there if teams want to pick that up. And the Charlie side is out on the beach, right underneath, right on the lowest point. And on that metal block nearby is a sniper rifle. So based off of those initial spawns, teams can then... Like, it's, it's symmetrical for the start, but after that it's quite, uh, quite dynamic as the extraction sites. So only the initial three are equidistant from the teams. The next three are all... They're in specific locations that, in, for example, if the teams were stuck on static spawns, uh, one would be closer to each side than the other, but because it's dynamic spawns, the teams can rotate around the map and force their own beneficial spawns in order to set up best for these objectives. Makes uh, sense. Yeah, so, like, at first I was considering playing it almost as a capture the flag style map, by uh, playing off with that, playing with that sort of uh, symmetry that it has, but for that to really be fair, I'd have to use a different capture the flag variant, so say two rounds with the teams alternating sides between the rounds, which is still something I want to look into in the future, but not now. Alright, it definitely makes sense. And so I've noticed that there aren't many vehicles on here. I think I saw a warthog, and that was about it. Maybe a ghost snuck in there somewhere. I've seen at least sniper and rockets out of the power weapons, and I'm pretty sure I saw a gravity hammer in the first playthrough. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, what was the decision behind adding the grab hammer? Playing a little griff ball down in wreckage? Uh, just going along with the covenant theme on that side of the map. Just figured, well, why not? It's a covenant weapon. It's you could imagine it just landing there amongst the pilot junk, and on the, it, it's a close quarters weapon, so it matches up with the shotgun on the other side. Obviously, not perfectly, but it does have a few. It does have a few differences which players can use to their advantage or play it to its strengths, rather. That was one thing I always liked that Halo 2 did, was a lot of the different maps that were asymmetrical would have one side have Covenant-themed weaponry, while the other side had UNSC-themed weapons. Okay, yeah. so our next map, I believe, that was Solace that was starting up. Yep, so Solace, one of our, well, the smallest map we have in the BTB scene right now, um, definitely in arena style. Is what people are referring to as, or MLG-esque. Um, I don't know, have you made any major changes to Solace coming into the Spring Challenge? Really, no. It was. It's pretty much remained unchanged from in how it was in the Winter Tournament. We've just... I've just done 
it made very minor alterations such as uh, a couple of spawns, um, the jump in the middle up to uh, blue tower. I don't think that. I think I shifted a few armor abilities around. Nothing, absolutely nothing major. Mostly all the power weapons and most of the spawns are all in the exact same place. Flags are still in the same place. So, and, and pretty much the same map that everybody's played and either loves or hates already. <laughs> since nobody seems to have a neutral opinion on this map, they either love it or they hate it. Yeah, Fallis is definitely a love or hate relationship with some people. Um, so oddly, you and I actually, with the Carbush Fishers Wake Up Scram, got to cast Formal's point of view on this map. Did you notice anything, um, I don't know, noteworthy, special, awesome, cool, crappy about Solace gameplay? One thing I noticed specifically from his point of view as a player that wasn't very familiar with the map was that he didn't seem to know you could go down low on the map until he fell bottom middle by the lift and didn't die, and then he was like, oh, well shit, I guess I can kind of walk down here. This is kind of cool. This is a big open space. I can use it to flank. But he didn't really go back down there very much. So, like, we always saw him pushing basically rocket side, except for maybe two times. I actually, um, and then I, I was watching Gandhi play with uh, Scrub Lords and Black Sheep. I think it was those two teams. And he actually did figure out the bottom end. He used it to uh, pull off a game-winning flank for his team. He flanked all the way from uh, Overshield side right the way across, past the binary rifle, which wasn't spawned at the time, and came around near the needle tunnel, hopped out with a DMR, and uh, basically laid down all the support and fire from there, which the other team wasn't expecting, and it let his team capture the flag that they needed to win. All right, one thing I heard you mention during that explanation was that there's a binary rifle on Solace. If anyone missed it, it's sort of hidden down low. Uh, what are you guys' opinions on that? What? Me and Audley are the chat. Um, anybody. The chat wants to participate. I want to hear from the chat. I didn't know there was a binary rifle on. I don't think we saw it in our cast of formal point of view. Doesn't it's... surprise me because nobody went down low. Like, that may yeah. be a problem with the design. Is that it, it's not really intuitive that you can go down low. You could also argue that's because players who played AGL and MLG variants are used to not being able to go down low due to the fact that it was blocked off before the game was even released. That is true. And I think another thing that leads to that is that people spawn by the ribs on both sides, and then they see that that's blocked off, and so they just assume it's blocked off everywhere. Yeah. But, I mean, it's definitely one of my favorite maps to play. And there are watch. actually a lot of long-range weapons down there, but obviously... The risk-reward factor for that is that you put yourself out of combat, you can't really help anybody from down there. You can get angles from the bottom onto the top towers, but that's not... When there's that big beam of light in the way as well, it's difficult to hit those shots. Uh, but yeah, there's the binary rifle, a few light rifles, and a couple of DMRs all down there as well, so... If you need if you need a weapon, that's the place to go. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the yeah. next... Yep, the next map we're going to move on to is another one from the Crimson map pack. I got it right that time is Shatter. So this is another one of the maps that not very many people are familiar with because it hasn't really shown up very much, but it's another one that you took and said, I'm going to make this work for BTB. I'm going to try and make this work <laughs> for BTB. After playing it a few times recently, I'm not so sure I succeeded in that, but what we have is a fairly medium-sized but me medium-sized map with a heavier weapon and vehicle layout than usual. Um, we've got, as you can see, the biggest defining factor of the map is that it's pretty much built for the Mantis, so there are two Mantises, one for each team. Um, and so, to offset those, we've got a lot of power weapons. We've got a damage boost top middle, Spartan laser bottom middle, um, four plasma pistols, two for each side, in each of the one in each sub-base and one in each main base underneath the teleporter ramp. We've got a rocket launcher on each side in the low caves. Oh, actually, there might be three plasma pistols each side. I think there's one in near the rocket launcher as well, leading up towards the middle area. So if, if anyone's new to BTB and you haven't gotten the hint yet, plasma pistols are good. They are your friend. Yeah, the, I, the plasma pistol is the kind of weapon that differentiates experienced big team players from new players, because you'll see that an experienced player will often just pick it up and carry it around in the back pocket until they need it. And they'll try to stay alive, especially if they know that the other team has vehicles up. 
well, ground-based vehicles at least, it's kind of difficult to hit a Banshee with an EMP shot. I've seen Game Sager do it, often. I said difficult, so <laughs> some players are going to be able to do it, but... <laughs> you know, she's going to pick it up for the first time, walk around and be able to shoot Banshees down at will. Unless it's a really, really bad pilot. But yeah, so the Plasma Pistol is really a friend, especially whenever there's a Mantis, or either a Scorpion or a Wraith tank. We don't actually use tanks in this set of maps, but they are all three of those vehicles get completely shut down by the EMP. They which even makes them really easy. Game. Yeah, well, the secondary turrets on the Scorpion and Wraith can, but nobody uses those. That's such a waste of a player. <laughs> I don't know, if you feel like you're taking a little ride around, pew pew little people. But so yeah, it, Plasma Pistol is your friend against heavy vehicles. Most definitely. And so, we're finishing up this video here, and when people are seeing the red side, seeing a railgun, flying up into the base, you saw the mantis below the base, uh, the snipers in the identical spots on each map hidden behind that door. Uh, I really like the layout of this map. Like, it may not play well, but it... Well, in terms it, of how it plays... It's into it, Dan. Yeah, in terms of how it plays, I'd like to think that it was just the fact that because it's DLC, that doesn't come up often. Both teams were really inexperienced with it, so they didn't have any, any idea of what to do. Inexperienced. Okay. And they, both teams just kind of ran around, everybody doing their own thing, not very well coordinated. Once it gets to the stage where teams have played it a few times and feel coordinated and they get strategies for the map, I think we'll see it start to play a lot better. Is it completely symmetrical or is it just functionally symmetrical? Oh, it, it's perfectly symmetrical. Okay, that that is one thing that I think it has going for it compared to every other map in Big Team other than Meltdown, which is the best map ever. I love Meltdown. Love the best. Unless you're host. Meltdown D-Rider! Hey, I like Meltdown. I like Meltdown! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so anything else to add? Move on to the next one? I'd just like to add that Meltdown is not perfectly symmetrical. The bottom middle section is not symmetrical. Fuck you and your logic, John! <laughs> Functionally symmetrical. And, and some of the rocks on the red side are higher than the ice Daddy on the blah blue side. rocks! Yo, we'll get to Meltdown when we get there. <laughs> Next video. <laughs> All right, Ragnarok. <laughs> it oh, didn't load in time. This map. Okay, if you've played Halo 3, you've played this map, and it's fairly similar. Spartan lays top middle, Banshee and Warthog behind each base. I never played Halo 3, what is this? And you'll. We've uh, also, however, I've. Uh, okay, let me go back to the start of that. Okay, in the interest of making it so that it's actually possible to move across the map, we've had to make a few adjustments. For example, the biggest one is that out on the open turret side, there's a damage boost, and a few Damn. extra crits, extra crits and barriers to be used as cover. And that damage boost, coupled with a, lot, a light rifle or a DMR can seriously open holes across the field on either side and give your team a chance to push up, get into the caves, push forward. If anyone wants lessons, watch any gameplay of Z to the 33 on Ragnarok and that's his life. He gets damage boost light rifle. Three shot. Pew pew pew! Kill. Two shot. Isn't it? Two shot. Uh, two sh uh, is it a three shot if it's two body shots and a head shot? Uh, it's, it's a two shot if the second one is unscoped because of the bleed through based on the burst, but if it's just using scope shots is three shot, but I think it's three to the body or head. It's that powerful, so you can just tear everything up. Nah. So yeah, the overriding where this map plays is you want, the banshees want to stay alive until laser control has been gained. Then laser kills one of the banshees. That banshee then does its best to provide as much of a of a support for the ground troops on its team as possible, pushing, killing spawn, killing newly spawned players giving somebody a chance to get into the base, which they can actually do more easily due to the speed boosts placed on each side as well. That's something new that we've recently that we added. The which... speed boost, did that replace the overshield? Yes. In the first version, we had overshields, uh, which players didn't seem to like, but we swapped those for speed boosts. And now people can get in and out of the bases with the flag and actually move it across all that open space much more e effectively, to the point that the game doesn't always stall. It keeps moving quite fluidly. Well, quite a bit more fluidly than it did. It's still not a particularly fast-paced fast map. Yeah, I can say personally from playing both versions of the settings, 
the overshield wasn't enough. Like, if you stole your opponent's overshield, you could get maybe to the front of their base, and then you'd get absolutely melted. Now course, we do have the double layer overshield. Thing. Yeah, now we, we've got a stronger overshield. It would probably be similar. So, again, we've got Banshees, Warthogs on each side. Only a single Warthog on each side, right? A single Hog and a Ghost on each side. Yeah. I don't think the Ghost was in Halo 3. What game types will this be playing? Just capture the flag. Because Slayer oh, okay. on this map is just horrendously slow. So right now, for those of you watching the stream, we are flying right by one of the speed boosts. And then in the identical spot on the other side of the map is the other speed boost. Then there's a saw on each side. And did, yes. you, did you keep the railguns? Uh, the railguns yeah, moved yeah, yeah, yeah. each team's tri rocks off the side cannon. Um, that's where the saw used to be, so I swapped the saw with the railgun. And the saw at the pelican side gave means that Teams, it, it's, it's a more dynamic weapon because it doesn't kill in one shot, so it, it allows a little bit more responsiveness and more error to fail on the user's side. So it makes combat around the pelican just a little bit more fluid. Whereas the railgun, you could pop and, pop and fire a railgun down a cave and kill anybody who just happened to be standing there at the time. No Plus time to react. You, you grab the saw and you pull the trigger and it's like, dack -a -dack -a -dack -a -dack -a -dack and it sounds like really fun. Oh. Um, the saw also three. does a lot of damage against the Banshee, which is really important from Pelican. So I've started the next one. It was one oh, too late. If only it could have made it slipped in right after we're talking about it. It's Meltdown. So Meltdown, um, probably one of the more changed maps over the amount of yep. settings you've had. There's been a lot of it works really well, and then one thing breaks it, and then we fix that, or you fix that. I don't know too much. And then something else opens up broken and so we try to fix that and next thing you know we're working towards what it's now have there been any major changes with the spawn placements in the updated version because that was something i noticed I added, was a real problem in season one i added a lot more spawns to each side like okay, that's it. clusters or like some individual spawns uh clusters okay. there's a cluster near the bottom cave entrance and outside of each team's garage now and there's also uh, another cluster up on the platform with the sniper rifle of either three or four spawn points each. Um, and I think I added a couple more somewhere as well. Can't remember exactly where. But yeah, there, there's more spawn points on each side, about uh, between eight and 12 spawns on each side, I think. Extra. And so we just flew through the bunkers. Um, so for anyone who's used to matchmaking Meltdown, that's one big change that's happened to our version of Meltdown is those teleporters are just gone completely. They used to be one way, now they're just gone. Yep, replace them with overshields uh, on the high ground, so a defensive position, but also a good pivot position as well. If you get the overshield in the, opponent te in the opposing team's uh, bunker, you can use that to really hold that area down and put more pressure onto their base from there. Gives you a good chance to push up as well, even be the guy who runs the flag. Yeah, and, and I think the overshield on Meltdown works the way that the overshield used to be intended to work on Ragnarok as something that you can pick up and just walk into your opponent's base and hopefully make a big enough hole that your teammates can push up. Well, the overshield is quite versatile because if you need to fall back with it or push with it, you can because it just gives. Just because you have extra health, you have extra options, you can take longer routes or more exposed routes without having to worry about dying straight away. So. It's that's what I find most interesting about that power. And, and we, we, uh, another big change is that because Dominion is out, where we had nothing but a middle before, we now have a damage boost. Mm. And so, right on top of the damage boost is the incineration cannon. I believe this is the only map we use that has an incineration cannon on it. Currently, yes. And so, some people get really angry that they call it overpowered. Um, it's very powerful, but. The way it's set up out in the middle of a bridge, it's really hard to get, so it's not that powerful. I actually reduced its ammo count by one, That was, and people haven't complained since. Yay, ammo counts. It was on uh, four total shots, now it's three. On a three minute time, so essentially there's one incineration kind of shot for every minute in the game. Makes sense. So, let's move on to our next one. We've got Longbow. So Longbow, one of our more traditional BTB maps. It's definitely on the scale of sort of old it's, favorites. I think it's the biggest map in the game. Uh, Ooh. Forge Island. Oh! 
Not counting Fudge Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so BTV is definitely probably the most classic feeling map we have, where it's big vehicles. I don't want to say dominate it, but if you have a good Banshee pilot, Game Sager, you're going to dominate this map. Yeah, because the biggest focal point is uh, the base at the top of the map. And so, because a lot of that's exposed and outdoors, if, if you actually want to do anything from that base, you need to be either on top of it or just outside of it. So you need to expose yourself to the Banshee, essentially. So if it's like the top, this top point of the map is where teams can set up from and put pressure on their opponent. But at the same time, the opposing Banshee can sweep players off that very quickly. Like just suddenly fly by, do a flip, fire a bomb, an accelerated bomb as Game Sager can do. And, that, and those accelerated bombs also actually curve towards the target. Like, they have significant bullet magnetism. I'm pretty sure it's amplified over the original bomb. So, you can pick people off with ease with Banshee that way. But the Banshee is still fairly fragile, so it can't expose itself for long. Otherwise, it risks being torn down by team shot, even from the battle rifle or even the pistol. The Magnum does a lot of damage to vehicles in this game. It did a lot of damage to vehicles in reach, as long as you shot in weak points. Yep. And so, up at the top base, we have a damage boost spawning outside. Uh, obviously, this is to reward the team that controls that base and give them something to push with. Guy can get the damage boost, try to go on a flank through one of the caves, or just charge out and put shots on people. Or you even give it to the sniper and just let him body shot everybody for instant kills. And then, in the dead center of the map, there's a small tunnel which has a speed boost, and that can be quite instrumental in actually moving the flag once it's pulled, if you don't have a vehicle at hand. Each team has an overshield uh, on the on the cliff just above the beach, near their sub base or garage, and underneath the overshield is a shotgun. And so, that is a defensive yet offensive tool again, where teams can either push with the overshield if they steal their opponents, or push it towards uh, the laser which spawns underneath the archway on the beach, or you can get the opponents and either push into their garage to control that if they have people camping out in there, lock the spawns in there, or oh. go all the way into the base. There's a lot you can do, a lot of options on this map, a lot of different ways to play it. My favorite option is the railgun, which we saw Disclaimer using a lot of in his scrambling against the car butch. Like, he would use those caves, grab the railgun, basically use it as a blue shotgun and just pop out with a flank on the pros and just catch them by surprise. And if he didn't get the kill with the railgun, he would clean him up with whatever rifle he was carrying. Yeah, Pad, de it was definitely one of the more enjoyable games that I've watched of Halo 4 so far, was, was watching Pat be so aggressive, or Pat's disclaimer, um, inside the opponent's railgun, and he was just doing such a good job being such a menace in there. And you could really tell that was a playstyle choice, and not just a, oh, this is a power kind of thing that you have to do. It was just like, he seemed to really enjoy doing that, and so he kept doing it. And it paid off for him in that game against the pros. Yeah. There was some uh, pretty pretty significant railgun kills in that game. Alright, so we'll swing up, we'll finish up this uh, view of top B and then we'll move on to the next video. So there you see the damage boost. Top B accessible for vehicles, but also it's got enough cover that uh, infantry can get inside the base to make sure they aren't getting mowed down by turrets. So our next video is going to be another new map. This one, one of my personal favorites that we've tried from the Crimson Map Pack, Harvest. It's so fun to play. I think this map is going to be a staple BTB map for Halo 4. People just need to get this DLC and actually play the map because it is really fun. Definitely one of the best, I'd say one of the top three maps in the game. I don't like the design of this map. I, I would agree with you when first looking at it. It, it looks like what 343 described it as with just some rocks so you can jump your warthogs off it and get achievements. But when you actually centralize things into the middle and then say, okay, use the outsides for what you want, but if you don't hold the middle, you're going to get destroyed, then Harvest actually becomes a quote-unquote BTB map. The middle looks and feels too cluttered from what I have played of it. I mean, I don't, I don't play much, but every time I feel... Like, I'm going through the middle. If you have everybody in that area, it's way too much of a clusterfuck. And 
And that's what I mean is that when we, I guess it's a play style choice to play competitively is when you aren't just thinking, oh, those rocks on the outside are for my Warthog. Because um, I know, John, you added speed boosts out there. Yeah. And so uh, with those speed boosts, that gives you these opportunities that you can grab them and just sprint into your opponent's base if they aren't watching you. So if everyone is, like you said, all these just cluster fucking in the middle, then someone grabs a speed boost and next thing you know is that they have a flag halfway back to their base. If you're going to clusterfuck in the middle, use protection. Grab a hard left shield. <laughs> okay, well, I feel like I should mention as well that the way the map plays is it's like it's split into three lanes, and the middle has the most desirable items. It's got the damage boost, bottom middle, and the rocket's top middle. But out on the sides of the map, it, you've got each team sniper rifles near their own base, you've got the speed boost a little bit out from the sniper. Behind all these rocks and such, around the outskirts, you've got DMRs and light rifles. So if a, if a team does cluster too heavily in the middle, it's so easy to spread out wide from both angle, both sides. Pick up these longer ranged weapons and just trap them in the middle. Because they, they won't be able to do anything once they're caught out in the open or caught moving from area to area against a team shot from a light rifle or from a DMR. And then it gives those players on the sides the ability to look for the spawns, which are set up kind of like Sanctuary, where it's basically, there's a bit large spawn, uh, well, a few spawn clusters in each uh, major segment of the map. So you'll be wanting to look either left, middle, or right, and based on your own position and where they just died. And so, so you can sort of cycle the spawns a little bit, kind of like that. Um, so that means it's just clustering in the middle or going all down one side and not you have to basically control two lanes at any given time. You can't just control one, otherwise you'll get trapped and uh, probably die a few times in a row before you can get back to any sort of position to fight back. And so, oddly, uh, back in 2010, was it? 2011? Sometime around there. You were a MLG pro coach for Turning Point. Um, that was Ninja's team, if anybody knows Ninja. Walshie's team, get it right. <laughs> um... But, so, I assume most everyone knows Ninja and Walshy. They're kind of famous. Mickwin. Kind of Nated. Famous. Nated. Kind of famous. Um, so, John made the analogy that Harvest spawns play a little bit like Sanctuary. Can you sort of extrapolate on how that works? In Sanctuary, there's basically three ways to spawn. You either spawn rocks, you spawn courtyard, or you spawn on flag. If you kill somebody rocks, they're going to spawn courtyard. If you kill somebody in their hut or courtyard, they're going to spawn... Well, if you kill them in hut, they're going to spawn rocks. If you kill them in rocks, they're going to spawn in either hut or courtyard. If you kill them on the flag, they'll probably spawn courtyard. But that was in Reach where everything was heavily death-influenced. In this game, it's more enemy presence-influenced than anything else. So I really don't think you can make a fair comparison between the two. Because it won't be like, oh, well, we just killed them on this side. They're going to spawn on the other side now. Let's run it this way. Mm -hmm. No, the, contr the control aspect is still there. It's where you have your players positioned as opposed to where you've killed the opponent's opposing team. The control is still similar, just using a different value instead, different... Yeah, but if you get got somebody sitting at the middle of the map and they kill somebody in the back corner, it's not going to stop them from spawning in that same back corner because of how death works in this game. It's so fucking useless of the spawn influence. You heard it here, everybody. Death is useless. <laughs> well, uh, that... It does uh, give the Warthog and Ghost a bit more of a more important role, though, because they can lock down the spawns on one side by themselves. Yeah, like, a Warthog, the Warthog spawn actually kill has, has to be spawn. mobile in this game. Yeah. It works pretty well. Alright. Have we got another map coming up? Yep, two more. Complex! Ooh, and he calls it! Ooh! Okay. All right. So, uh, Oddly's doing my job for me. Our next map is Complex, uh, another, at least I would say, one of my favorites. A fan favorite, I would assume. It's one of the more enjoyable game types to watch, especially Extraction on it. This is the one that everybody who is used to small-scale games hits, but it actually plays really well for big team. 343 putting it in for um, team objective and whatnot just doesn't seem to make sense. It seems like it needs 6v6 at least. Well, isn't Team Objective supposed to be 6v6 soon? Oh yeah, it, it's going to be scaled up to 6v6 if it hasn't been already. I haven't that, checked Objective today. That'll be perfect. Then yeah, again, it's that 
Cat would actually see playlist was also supposed to be 66. But back to the point, let's talk about <laughs> complex here. I know there's rockets because I've seen Siphon play this map. Yes, there's rockets in the middle platform uh, in the central courtyard. There's damage boost because we've seen people go on huge killing sprees with damage boost sniper. Yep, S uh, sniper rifle for each team underneath the uh, inside the bases that they spawn nearby. So for a red team, that's a little off to the left. And for blue team, it's directly underneath them. Uh, there's also an overshield underneath uh, the building called Seven. That's that large building, the tallest building with the uh, flat white roof. So overshield's right on the bottom of that. And we also have a shotgun underneath the ramp leading up to the damage boost. Yeah, we just flew by that for anyone who's sort of uh, out of sync. Um, again, with it being an extraction focused map, spawn control is such a huge aspect of this. And there's one spawn near blue base. Of course, the spawns on site at their dynamic again, so blue team don't have to worry about this spawn being exclusive to them. That's really hard to break out from. So if you can, if your team can force the other team to spawn in that place repeatedly, it's a really, it, it can almost guarantee you an, an extraction or two. So you can get a few points just from forcing that spawn. And in Slayer game types, again, if you can force that spawn, it's going to give you, I'd say, easily six to six to twelve kills on the scoreboard. Alright, I just want to throw in a short intermission here. We've been getting reports that the Twitch chat seems to be broken. Uh, but the workaround for that is if you go to your URL bar and then at the end of twitch.tv slash btbtv, enter in slash old after that and go to that link. It'll bring you back to the old. Or just click at the top where it says go back to the old page. Just click that. Yep. And it should take you back. And apparently all these have the chats working there. Yeah. Alright, so... If anyone's and chat's just doing the wheel of death, that's where to go. Back to the actual map, I have a question for Matt. Other than Siphon and the BTB versus Pros scrim, have you seen anybody really make use of the hologram in this map? Um, I actually try to use it myself, especially around uh, around the Alpha extraction site. I like to get the hologram and either the shotgun or an automatic weapon and just chill around there when it's uh, captured and use the hologram as bait. If a player is weakened and they're running towards that trying to get a clutch extraction and they see a hologram pop out, more often than not they're going to react to it because they have to react. If they react wrong they're going to die. Um, and then it's easy to uh, take advantage of that quick lapse in judgment and step out and finish them off. What it also, work, it also, works, also works great with uh, grenades as well throw the hologram followed by a grenade. What other armor abilities are on this map? Uh, there's a jetpack near each team's initial spawn. Um, there's a thruster pack on top seven. And... I think... Uh, there's another thruster pack near the uh, lift room. It's on the walkway up to the top of that room. So basically one thruster pack on each high roof. Jetpack on each starting base. And the hologram bottom underneath here. I can't think of any more armor abilities on this map off the top of my head. So, one thing we've seen actually in two different games, one from Disclaimer and one from Formal in the Carburst vs. Wake Up series. Um, the damage boost out back of the base we're currently in right now, uh, we've seen that comboed with Sniper, uh, once leading to an overkill from Disclaimer and another time leading to a triple uh, from Formal. Followed by a choked overkill because he couldn't land the shot. What a scrub. <laughs> Guess... Guy calls himself a pro, gets out, out sniped by a disclaimer. I gotta admit, though, it was a damn sexy play until he just missed the snipe. It was like, oh, well, no. He... Didn't Formal kind of make the damage for his pointless because he got all headshots anyway? <laughs> yeah, he just yeah. blamed everybody. Alright, we're gonna move on to our final map as it loads. Exile. No, I don't mean Reach Exile. I mean Halo 4 Exile. What an exile in Reach? The one that actually seems to fit its name. Is oh it, you know, the map actually looks like somewhere where somebody The map would be looks exiled. like someplace I would never want to fucking go. <laughs> exactly. Why I would veto this map every time it comes up. Okay, so again, this is another map that we only play extraction on. Three sites active at a time, six sites total. 
and uh, there's a Banshee on this one, and a Mantis, and a Rocket Hog. We don't say much of the Rocket Hog, but it's actually significantly more powerful in Halo 4 than it was in Halo Reach. Each one of those rockets packs a much bigger punch, so it's a pretty significant threat to both the Banshee and the Mantis. Most of, most of the Mantis and the Banshee, because if the pilot has half a brain, he won't get close enough to get rocketed and he won't let it lock on. But if he's not very good, the Rocket Hog can kill the Banshee in a single volley, I think. And it takes, uh, after one volley of direct hits, the Mantis goes from full shields to being on fire. So any sort of prior damage will make that extremely vulnerable to the Rocket Hog. And so right now we're flying through what's referred to as A-Base. Uh, I think people are also referring to it as Metal now. Um, so that's the base you want to control on this map. The majority of the extraction points, I believe four of the six, maybe wrong, um, are all on that side of the map or in the middle. And they yeah, actually dominate. Six, and then the fifth is uh, bottom middle and the last and C is out on the that, Rocket Hog side. That probably contributes to why you don't see a lot of the Rocket Hog there. It's dead space to go over that way. Yeah, there's quite a bit, quite a few reasons to go over there, though. There's the rocket hog, the concussion rifle, and the overshield, all fairly close to each other. But there aren't objectives over there. Yeah. And um, well, just from a team standpoint, C is kind of your last resort if you get pushed back out of the rubble side of the map. You take C. So I see you, rubble scum. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, the, the overshield and concussion rifle and the rocket hog are there for a reason. They aren't necessarily something you would go out of your way to go and get to come back across the map. But if you're forced to spawn on rocket hog side of the map, they're very good well setup breakers. Exactly. And the overshield, um, again, I've seen Gandhi clutch in another extraction game with the overshield. He picked up the overshield, jumped up to top middle, and ran out and tanked shots with that while he captured air. And he just managed to convert it as he died. Um, and that actually went on to be the game-winning extraction again. That's one more reason I love the new uh, Team Throwdown um, version of the double-layered overshield. Uh, it it fixes so many problems with the overshield. Um, the the pre-double overshield single-layer version was basically worthless. Uh, if you picked it up, your shields were gone immediately anyway. Essentially, every overshield since Halo 3, where it switched to one layer instead of two, has been... <laughs> Not really a significant enough power up to really be a power up. It doesn't compare to camo, which we don't even have in this game. It doesn't really compare to damage boost, and even speed boost is, is arguably more versatile than it. But now that it's quite strong again with two layers of overshield, it matches up to those other power ups, and it's better to put them all on the same timer, same two minute time, two minute respawn time. All, all these favorite combo, I think, will probably be the storm rifle damage boost. If you ever see that, you will probably just your pants. I actually like the concussion rifle more than the storm. <laughs> all right. Pretty much anything with storm. damage boost works well. Damage boost wins. Personally, I like the saw with the damage boost. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people. I like the saw better without the damage boost because you get to hear it for longer before you get the kill. <laughs> You want to go for it? You have the damage boost with the saw, you run into that room and you kill everybody in that room. Kill all the things. Alright, so anything else to add on Exile? Um, again, it's all about spawn, spawn influence, spawn control. You want to be controlling certain sections of the map in order to control um, extraction sites. So, for example, the air site, if the other team has Banshee control, control of the Banshee side of the map, the cave up there. They have such a good line of sight on it that they can kill, they're going to be able to kill you off of it before you can really do anything to it, so you have to have you have to have at least cleared that side of the map before you can successfully take the risk of uh, going to convert the air point. So it's, uh, it's all about sight lines, angles, and spawns. Halo in a nutshell. Alright. We're going to switch back to the podcast. Welcome back, everybody. We don't want to keep you here all night. Um, or do we? <laughs> Are we evil? <laughs> All right. I'm just trying to keep you from earning your CSR 50s by the end of the night. Oh, by the way, get a CSR. Is it 30 or 35? By 35. the end of this week, and then you will get a free Avatar t-shirt. It, ha it, has to be, it has to be in Castle DLC. Oh, yeah. 35 in Castle DLC to win a free Avatar item. Um, 
along with that, any of you in the chat, uh, we've been trying to push this. If we get to 50 viewers, we're going to give away Castle Map Pack codes. We have them. We want to give them to you. Invite your friends, and you have a chance to win. Also, Vanny's been in the chat. She's been trying to give away uh, some avatar codes. She has Master Chief armor, I believe it is, for either male or female characters. So if you want Master Chief armor, start talking. We love you. Um, but uh, one thing we want to mention is, again, this week, uh, Random Black Man, Noir, and possibly Black Sheep, the, the team, um, are going to be trying to run lobbies and getting as many people as they can in them. So right after the show, message gamertag random black man or noir qua machina. And they will try to get you into those lobbies. We want to fill those up. We had a full one last week play for, I think, about two hours. So if you want to get some good games in, experience some BTB, that's definitely where you want to be. Well, that's pretty good. Um, getting a lobby going for two hours straight. Yeah, that's... it's been a while since that's happened in Halo 4. Or it hasn't even happened in Halo 4. Um, a quick note for any of you who haven't gotten any of the past DLC. The War Games map packs will be 1,600 Microsoft points. That's a discount down from 2,000. And both the Crimson and Majestic map packs will be at 600 Microsoft points apiece instead of their usual 800. That expires on April 12th. And the uh, Crimson map pack will actually be required for this upcoming... Uh tournament so if you want a chance at a thousand dollars you're going to need those maps so get them while they're on discount also or just thing. get them now yeah get them meow um another thing i forgot to mention is we have this empty space over on the side of the channel uh over i think it'd be over there yeah probably right there uh oh no it's that way that way it's right there uh we have the Twitter feed going, so if you want to get active with us, just tweet at official BTB, and you'll pop up, and you'll be famous, and we'll read your tweet, and we'll love you. Um, so this week, uh, if anyone didn't know, uh, today there was a title update, and last week there was also a matchmaking update. Um, there were some new playlists added. Multi-team, the original way it used to be played back in Halo 3 before it became 3v3v3v3. v I mean, when Reach launched. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, uh, I mean, wasn't this the Reach launch version? Uh, I think Pretty Reach... Didn't Reach start 3v3v3v3? No. No, I think it was six... T uh, six it was six teams, teams of two. Of two. Oh, yeah. Halo 3's version was four teams of two. And then Halo 2's version of multi-team, which is the original version of multi-team, Ruben, learn your fucking Halo history here. Was 3v3v3v3, and it had the greatest game types such as neutral flag on foundation, it had four flag on warlock. It, it was the greatest. Halo 2 nostalgia. It had no, it was it's King of the game. Hill on foundation that was so good. Oh, dear god. And they had maybe three ball on foundation, maybe. All right. There, there were some really good game types back in Halo 2 when there were four teams of three. Three, four, three. We need three members on four teams with game types like three ball. Three, four, three. Get it? Let's do it. All right. So if, if you follow that entire rant, um, multi-team in Halo 4 will be six teams of two battling out in Slayer and Objective games. So if you're a multi-team fan from any past Halo and you like... Those this, are teams. This, those it's are, basically... It's free for all like, of that, buddy. It's piggyback rides. <laughs> so oddly gets carried in multi-team is basically what he's saying. Um, and so obviously, with the release of the Castle Map Pack... Uh, today, earlier this morning, um, the Castle DLC playlist has started. It accidentally launched 4v4, but Bravo tweeted a while ago that it's been fixed. It's now 6v6 Slayer and Objective games on Daybreak, Perdition, and Outcast. Um, if you guys haven't checked out the uh, short little, rev short little, double, I don't know, yeah, uh, the review that uh, Matt Clan, me, and Oddly did. MacLean, oddly and I, I can't speak English. Um, nope. Makes me sad. Okay. Front page of BTVNet. BigTeamBattle.net. 
the front page article you'll see is a short little castle map pack. I said it again. <laughs> it's, a pre- it's a preview because we, we got the maps uh, a couple of days early, took a look through those, and we put our first impressions down on that uh, in that article. So Spoiler if you want to see, alert, there's one yeah, good map. <laughs> arguably two, depending on the game type yeah. and how it's tweaked. We shall see. Professionally, I must say all three of these maps are just fantastic, and I I, I have to thank three four three and certain Infinity for making these maps to improve our Halo experience. Well, I, actually, actually, you know, I'm gonna go back on what we just said. <laughs> um, you can say that there's only one good map, but that's from a fairly competitive standpoint. It's quite possible that all three maps are good for what they're intended for, which would be matchmaking BTB. Yeah, I'm sure Outcast will be great for big team battle Infinity Slayer. Dominion. It might not be too bad for Dominion, actually, because that Circle would apply. Circle jerking in those tunnels that just run around each other. And there are caves where on one wall of the cave, people will spawn facing that way. And on the other wall, they spawn facing that way. What is the point of that? My camera for everything froze. All the things froze. All right. So we're just going to speed through some of the rest of this. Um, Rumble Pit was added. Infinity Rumble and Rumble Pro. So basically that means Infinity Slayer settings or your normal. Um, I don't want to call it normal, but it's the original Halo, like Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo Combat Evolved form of gameplay. Um, John, I think you've played some of that. Correct? No? Have you played any uh-huh. Rumble Pit playlists? I haven't, I haven't played uh, the Rumble Pit playlist yet. I wanted to, but I've uh, only played a bit of Castle DLC today. Okay. Uh, while it was 4v4, I got a couple of achievements. Um, we played Perdition, I'd say, I think three or four games on Perdition, and one on each of the other maps. And I actually really, really like Perdition, because the way it's such an angular map, grenade bounces and throws, you can actually do some very interesting things with grenades. Um just based on bouncing them up of certain angled ramps or off of certain walls so that they land at a doorway as somebody's coming around there. In Across four games, I had a lot of fun with the grenades. Some really nice sight lines as well um, that a good sniper could take advantage of, for example. So, like, fairly difficult shots through narrow spaces. But overall, it's uh, definitely a very fun map to play. All right. and, uh, with, I, I can speak a little bit about Daybreak as well. Uh, the Banshee seems a little out of place on the map. But overall, it plays Capture the Flag better than I expected it would based on uh, the preview that I took. Okay. It's uh, not too difficult to get the flags out of the bases and then to keep them moving. At least not five, uh, 4v4 it wasn't. Once more players are out of the map, it might be a, a completely different experience. So we'll have to see about that. Um, we'll probably see that whatever our next event is, you're probably going to work on something for those. So definitely keep an eye out for test settings. Uh, and then two just short updates: objective and action sack both got updated, um, adding some extraction, updating the playlist size, some more um, game types: fiesta, random weapon spawns, uh, in action sack, lightning flag, sprint was removed. At least that's what the notes say. I haven't played it. <laughs> um, sprint removed that's uh, interesting I 343 said it couldn't be done they're doing it no, no they didn't oh they said they weren't going to I've, uh, recently on twitter I'm pr- pretty sure I've seen either Bravo or Quindel Hoyo respond to people asking about uh, Sprint and well I don't think they promised anything but they said that they'd look into it oh and hallelujah amen so we'll see where that goes. Oh, sp- speaking of uh, tweets, I was recently in a, a Twitter conversation with uh, Bravo asking about potentially getting a big team battle.net playlist. Oh, yeah. And uh, he said it's not, not beyond the realm of possibility. We, uh, and that he'd definitely come to our site if uh, they do decide to implement a more competitive big team playlist. Okay. So the big update of today was CSR, Competitive Skill Ranking, was launched that? today. Uh, it's 343's attempt at a ranking system that they said was never going to be here, 
but they heard the outcry of the competitive community who wanted it so bad, and they implemented get, it. Does this mean I get a pretty big number in my name in the game? No, it doesn't. Uh, unfortunately, well, what the fuck's the point? <laughs> unfortunately, three four three not wanting to. I don't. I, I assume it was add to the UI or have to make changes to that, or maybe they didn't want to influence players' um, uh, social well-being in the game by feeling bad that they had low levels or anything. Um, your rank is only visible on Halo Waypoint. So if you visit your matchmaking slide in the Halo Waypoint stats, there's a little section for your CSR rank. If you, if you have a um, device that can run Xbox Smart Glass as well, you can view it from that. Yep. So if you have... Ooh. If you if you've got I an iPhone... To, I get to pull up my my rank on my phone and see, Oh, hey, I'm 23 now. Dang. Um, one of the big complaints coming... Oh. Um, before I go on, uh, there's been two sections of CSR ranked playlists. There are individual ranked. Um, you can read this all in the bulletin, but basically it got split down the middle. There's individual skill ranked playlists where if you put up huge numbers, you rank up faster. And then there's the classic ranking playlists where it's team based, where if you lose, you go down. If you win, you go up. It, essentially, you can think of it that the, uh, the performance based playlists, uh, they're following a similar formula to Halo Reach's Arena before it was updated to win-loss in Season 7, uh, whereas the win-loss-based playlists are either post-Season 7 Arena or similar to Halo 3's ranked playlists, where you have to win successively to go up, and you can risk dropping down from losing. And so the immediate reaction for CSR was there are definitely some bumps in it. Uh, not something anyone wasn't expecting. I mean, releasing a whole new ranking system that 343 said they took true skill and they tried to modify it extremely well so that it didn't end up like Halo 3. Um, Halo 3 being you get matched with boosters every other game or you get matched with people not on your level, etc. Uh, one big conflict that people have been having, and I feel like they're giving up too fast on CSR, is that in the first like five hours of playing, people are ranking up really fast and then getting matched with low-level people and assuming that's how it's going to be for all games for all eternity. And I made a really long post on THC about it. If you visit, I think it's the second or third page of the CSR's live thread in general discussion. Um, players were getting really worried and all angry. Well, we'll use that. Uh, about butt hurt. <laughs> extremely butt hurt. I think you could, you could, you could uh, most politically call it a misunderstanding of how the system works and how it's supposed to work. And so, for anybody who sort of no, has heard of True Skill but doesn't know exactly how it works, that you have two two variables go into it. You have your measured skill and your perceived certainty. So, in other words, how well does the game believe it knows you're at that rank that you're measured <laughs> skill? Um, so, as you play, you if you win, your measured skill goes up. If you lose, your measured skill goes down. The more you lose, the more you go down, the more your uncertainty becomes certain. So it becomes less of a factor influencing your level. Same thing if you win a bunch and then lose, it's going to be like, whoa. And so, uh, people are kind of viewing it as, like, the example on THC was somebody had played, I think it was like 30-something straight games of Dominion, and they hadn't lost. And this was at like 6 o'clock in the morning today. And, right after the system went live. Yeah, like literally CSR launched, and they played 30 games of Dominion and didn't lose. And then they were level 28, 23, they had a mixed party of like high 20s. And they mashed a party of all level 1s. And then they just went, oh, GG343, your system sucks. But what they don't understand is that in the... So 343 announced that their system was supposed to work with all people uh, who play will not get matched with somebody who is less than 10 levels below or above them. So plus or minus 10 from your rank, you won't get matched with them. Anyone who can do math, 28 plus or minus 10 doesn't fall in the range of 1. So what people were saying is, oh, this system must not work, it's completely broken. But they didn't take into account that the only people playing were the people who were 28 and a bunch of new people who were level 1. Maybe there's like a 3 or a 4 thrown in there or something. But when you win 30 straight games, 
the game is thinking to itself, okay, here's your measured skill. That's going up really fast because you're winning over and over again. Your uncertainty is, well, I don't know. Are you really fucking good because you haven't lost a game? Or are you only playing noobs and just dominating them? So your uncertainty is like, I, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm going to jack your rank up. But then the first game that you lose, you're going to plummet. If you go 30 and 1, Trusco is going to say, oh, you won 30 games in a row and then lost to some random people. I guess I wasn't very certain that you're a 30. You must be something more like a high mid-20 or something. If you lose again, same thing happens. And I'm not sure it would visually uh, plummet like that, though. I think that the, si the systems are designed to be slowed down a little bit so you don't see that huge variance after a single game. Yeah, and so this is one of the modifications that 343's added so that you don't see this like, oh, I ranked up to 48 in five games and then I lost one game and I'm a 10. Like, what the hell happened there? It's designed so that you sort of progressively level up, progressively level down. There's probably some more variables thrown in there to sort of even it out based on like if your teammates quit or something. But The, ori the original true skill system was actually designed to be able to guess your eventual move, which is your actual displayed level in 13 games and one of the problems with the system is that it actually tries to just continue that assumption that that's where you're going to be as a skill level for the rest of your time playing it once it becomes certain of your skill level it's really hard to move it which is why people in like halo 3 had problems with getting rank lock and stuff because once your sigma drops enough which is your uncertainty Sigma is uncertainty, Mu is the number everyone sees. Once that drops low enough, it stops thinking like, oh, well, I guess uh, we're wrong about your Mu. Maybe we should change that. It, it just figures, oh, well, you're going to win about 50%, lose about 50%. I don't, I'm, I, I'm not going to change my mind just because you just won six in a row. Fuck you. Okay. Looks like we've got some questions. Um, before that question, I just want to throw on one last example. If it's unclear to people, uh, basically, what people are seeing right now, the example I used on THC was uh, the law of large numbers. Uh, it's this common thing where the more data you have, the more likely you are to actually guess what the correct value to some data set is. And so the uh, common example for that is if you take a six-sided die and you roll it once, and let's say you get a three, then your data right there says that the probability of rolling a six-sided die is 100% you will roll a three, 0% you'll roll anything else. If someone walked up to you on the street and said, this die, it's so unbiased die, well, if I roll it, it's 100% guaranteed to roll a three, you'd be like, wait, are you insane? And so that's what's happening right now, is that people are just experiencing this one high wave before it starts to sort of level out. The graph looks kind of like a tidal wave sort of thing um, until you level out and your rank actually becomes consistent. And that's what Adi was talking about, is when you get quote-unquote level locked. Anyway, Reclaw had a question. Okay, I think I can answer this question, so if you'd like to read the question out, since I can't actually see the chat right now. Um, Reclaw asked, Why aren't AAs a part of the BTB experience as ordinance? Or is there, I feel like a hard light shield could be utilized for protecting an extraction, etc. Okay, initially we did actually have armor abilities as personal ordinance. Uh, once you got 100 points, you could call down either a Promethean Vision, a hard light shield, or a thruster pack. However, with the bumper jumper control layout, this actually interferes with grenade switching. Um, the same button, the same left and right D-pad buttons to call down ordnance are also what you use to switch grenades. And so that essentially breaks the controller layout. And I also found a bug Way with personal... Way to go, three, four, three. I also found a bug uh, with personal ordnance where if... I'm not sure how latency-based this was, but if you attempt to call it in, like the exact moment you die, the, ordin the ordinance doesn't drop, but the uh, menu thinks that it's dropped, so you get three blank options, which are constantly refilled. Like, your whole ordinance meter is refilled every time you die, and it just gives you three blank options, so you can't actually do anything with it, which is this huge UI blob that you can't do anything with on the screen at once. And so after those two, uh, after working out those two issues, I decided that it was probably a better move to get rid of the personal ordnance completely and place more armor abilities on the maps, which you'll see on maps like Solace, there is actually a hard light shield on there. Um, they're typically a little bit out of the way, but 
Sometimes it can be beneficial to go out of your way to get a regeneration field, jetpack, a hard light shield, Promethean vision, that sort of stuff. Um, we had another question from Wong Strong Finish. Um, said, will the spring season games be played at the weekend or just a time that's ideal for everyone? Um, it's definitely along the lines of a time that's ideal for everyone. We want this to be both something that is viable for people to watch. Because we, we want you guys to be able to watch these games that are competitive at a high level and enjoyable. But we also don't want to make it so that players have to play 18 hours a day or something in order to compete in this tournament. So we're trying to find a good balance where the stream quality will be good and at times that most everyone can watch it so that it's not at 5 a.m. for someone in Europe or something. But also balance it so that if you're playing in it, you don't have to commit to God knows how long. And of course the fact that it's now a tournament as well means that it's uh, going to be done in one or two days. It's not going to be... We're not going to drag it out over the course of uh, several weeks. And one reason that I personally prefer that is the fact that the, the top prize is $1,000 for the winning team. And if you, when you think about the time investment, you put that over a one or two days, that's, that's pretty good. $100 per person, yeah, that's quite a good time investment. But right. if you stretch that out over a six-week ladder period, that's, it's basically nothing for the time that you've put into it. Um, and so one thing that uh, Vanny wanted us to mention is Molly's planning on writing up a thread uh, as soon as we can get everything finalized for you guys, and then the, all the information will be out there. You'll be able to plan, find teams, everything you need. Um, she wanted to clarify that the spring challenge is going to be a tournament. It's going to be a bracket, you play other teams, winner takes all sort of thing. In the summer, where we know more people is, are going to have more free time, we're going to run a season there that's going to be an extended length sort of weekly match, weekly or maybe two matches a week, something. That's my hand. Um, where people will be able to sort of make that longer-term commitment, not have to commit so much time to one day and to be able to get more of a long-term BTB experience out of it. Basically like what we did with Reach. Yeah, so it'll be more along the lines of Reach Season 1 and Season 2. Okay, anything else, or are we uh, getting close to being done here? We have to wish luck to the teams that are competing at AGL Nashville this upcoming weekend. Hmm. So oh, I yes. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm, we definitely want to see some good Halo played over this weekend. Well, I, I mean, to... specifically the teams consisting of players from BTB Net, such as the 15 seed, Costa, Communist, Insanity, and Drake, known as Steady Flow. I wish a ton of luck to Communist, Insanity, and Drake, as they will have to carry Costa this entire weekend. Um, and I believe uh, Demonicide was also on a team. However, from what I've seen on Twitter, that team has fallen apart last minute, and he's desperately trying to find three teammates to go with. So if anybody is in that area and can help him out, wants to team with him, uh, you guys should definitely hit him up. His game aside, his game attack is Demonicide. So I would drive up to Nashville this weekend, but I'm going to be in Ohio, unfortunately. And then also, uh, anyone who sees Random Black Man posting on the forums, he's the one who hosts all these custom game nights that are going to be right after the show. He's also going to be in Nashville. He will be decked out in BTB swag. He'll be handing out wristbands, handing out business cards, giving you high fives, giving you a hug. Talking to you, playing Halo with you. He might go buy a beer with you if you're of age. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, definitely be sure if you're in the Nashville area, head out to AGL Nashville, hang out with some cool people. All right, I'm going back to the chat now. So that's pretty much all the Any content. Questions? Yeah, that's that's like all the content we have. So eight yeah. minutes of questions, maybe. Yeah. I know we covered a lot considering all the map detail and everything. The um, fly-throughs are up on YouTube. So, youtube.com slash official BTB TV. It's up there on the side. Go to that link. It'll have all of our videos, commentaries of the past scrims and past tournament gameplay, uh, along with fly-throughs and past episodes of BTB TV. It, it will include... Basically, any past games that people submit to us, you actually have to send the games to us if you want them featured. Oh, that's important. That's something we should mention. Is it is now going to be a rule 
a rule, as in you will lose if you do not submit or at least save your gameplays. Just let that soak in. Doesn't need to be good. If we just get a bunch of gameplays, we can pick and choose the ones we want. But if you don't submit them, you're breaking the rules. <laughs> the chat is more concerned with Perry the Platypus. Yeah, yeah. it is rather distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly's drunk. <laughs> Just playing with a fucking platypus. I'm not. I'm I not an not had anything to drink yet. Oh, oh, I believe we're better. I believe we're better give away coming up. Hey yo, Myth, I see you posting in the chat. Get in some of those custom lobbies that are happening after this. Show so people what? what it's like to play VTB competitively. Apparently, we have a one uh, castle DLC map code to give away. So, who wants it? Oh, all right. So here, I'll switch over to the screen so people can see. So we have a code, and you people in the chat can get that code. Um, so I'm gonna update the list. Um, basically, you have to be following the channel, and you have to be a registered user. So if you're ghosting, stop ghosting, or else you won't get picked. Um, obviously, no mods. Are gonna come into this. Mods aren't gonna win anything. Um, no but <laughs> oh wait, I already have the map. Oh. Um, so yeah, it ba there's no stipulations. No, oh, if you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. It's follow the channel. We just want to show you guys some love. We thank you guys so much for tuning into these shows and listening in to us talk about stuff and watch oddly play with a platypus. Is that a euphemism I should be worried about? <laughs> <laughs> no, please no. Ozzy plays with his platypus on stream. Alright. I'm not familiar with that game. <laughs> is that on Steam? Or is that XBLA? <laughs> with his platypus. I'm googling it. Alright, yeah. So, uh, unfortunately my chat's broken in here. So I can't see what you guys are saying. But, luckily... There's two chats. So I'll give you guys like another 30 seconds. Hopefully by now you have created an account if you're ghosting out in the wilderness somewhere. In the meantime, bring back up the camera so Hundler can see that Perry is waving. Uh, you're frozen. Oh. Unfreeze, <laughs> Perry! Unfreeze! I wonder why my internet keeps freezing my camera like that. It's so lame. Because your upload is like negative 10,000. This is true. Fuck Alabama internet. You don't need technology. Not when you have the Bible. I'm not going to go any further than that. Let's just stop this right now. <laughs> wow, Matt Clan. Alright, so I'm going to update it one last time. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to get a winner soon? Yep. Three, two, one, go. Yoshi! Yoshi! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Yoshi rigged MT bias. I know. I call MT bias. <laughs> it's so rigged. Um, so Yoshi, it's gonna it's gonna come down to this. If you already have the maps, we aren't gonna give you the code. We'll give you a armor code so you can wear some pretty Master Chief armor. And then um, give the maps to somebody else. Uh, if he doesn't have them, um, yeah, Yoshi says he doesn't have them, so. I can't rig that. As much as that seems rigged, this thing's random. But anti bias. But you guys want to know something awesome? We still have two more codes to give away. So uh, if on our next stream or our next BTB episode next week, um, that that number is still going to stay the same. If we break 50 viewers, we'll give away a code to somebody. So be sure to follow the channel. Follow us on Twitter to see when we go live. Twitter's at official BTB. Uh, subscribe to our right? YouTube. That's at uh, youtube.com slash official BTB TV. How, how many YouTube su subscribers do we currently have? Uh, 118, I believe. Maybe we should give away the other code when we get to 150? Maybe 200? Um, well, at 200, we're giving away $500. If we can reach 200 YouTube subs and 600 Twitch follows. 
we'll be giving away five hundred dollars. And if we reach, so we've already passed our goal of a hundred YouTube subs, and That's now good. we're just waiting for the Twitch follows. And so, if we go to Twitch, we have two hundred and sixty-three followers right now. Why is my camera we, still frozen? <laughs> we need thirty-seven more follows, and we're going to be giving away sixteen hundred Microsoft points to one of our followers. So be sure again if you're ghosting, create an account. Create an account wins you stuff. Follow the channel. And we'll be giving that away whenever we reach 300. Again, once we reach 200 YouTube subs, 600 Twitch follows, we'll be giving away $500. Like, like not fake dollars, like $500 in cash. Like, just handing out that cash. Alright, so, any other shoutouts before we go? Anything I forgot? Um, random shoutout to Jenny Bunny because she told me to give a shoutout to her. Might as well shout out to everybody else on MT, and uh, I want to give a shout out to Black Sheep as well, the team that scrimmed us so much recently. Uh, thank you guys for actually playing against us, giving us some much needed practice on the DLC maps, especially. Most definitely. Oh no, I'm a loading circle. <laughs> All right, Adi, you good? Uh, shout out to Jenny because she's whining for attention. <laughs> Also, she's called both of you out for not checking your phones during the show. I know, she texted Excuse me, I replied. And then my phone died. I'm trying to I mono ask Jenny. Shout out to Hunler for not knowing the difference between a platypus and a duck. <laughs> and well, to be fair, it does look a lot like a duck. Ducks don't have beaver tails. Or, I guess, platypus tails. <laughs> also... Perry the Platypus is a very famous character. Alright, so with that, since Oddly's not coming back and you can't see Oddly's platypus anymore. Oh, also, we wanted to mention, <laughs> Sang so Sang Meow, whoever's in charge of that account, you're fucking hilarious. I love you for having that. And also to Incubad for tweeting at us. Uh, that's one way we want to get more interaction, is if you guys have Twitters, the Twitter stream's always going to be up here. Just be tweeting at us all the time. Yeah, Papa, that's how you tweet. Um, but with that, we are going to call it a night. This is B2B TV episode 10. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we will see you next time. Yep, thanks for watching. See you next week. I'm going to talk over the music.
sun call, it keeps me waiting. The ones to catch me if I fall. I can feel it and I know it's not the same. I'm the one, you're the drug to ease my pain. I was one.